Hello everyone, my name is Richard McSherry. I'm the uh, pastor of the Shaftesbury Methodist Church. I'm glad that we could join with you today. Um, we're here in the sanctuary of the First Baptist Church on Main Street. Um, and we're glad to be with you and uh, hope you're enjoying this uh, service through CAT TV. Uh, we're so glad that uh, we could be here to um, encourage you and, and support you and, uh, and hopefully uh, bring a little insight uh, into things. So let's um, turn to uh, the Lord in prayer at this time. Gracious God, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for these beautiful summer days that you have blessed us with. And we just pray, God, that um, as we uh, meditate on your word today, that you will enliven that word to us, even as we gather in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Our first hymn <clears throat> is O oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing, and it was written by Charles Wesley, who was a prolific writer. He wrote over 6,000 hymns. And this has to deal with his joy on finding the Lord and, and just rejoicing in the Lord's presence in his life. So I want to share um, uh, the first two verses with you. I'm just going to read them, and then we're going to just have a musical meditation uh, on that. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God and King, and the triumphs of his grace. My gracious Master and my God, assist me to proclaim, to spread through all the earth abroad, the honors of thy name. O oh, four thousand tongues to sing. this time we're going to um, have a reading from the book of Psalms and we're going to read the very first Psalm in the Bible which tells us the qualities of a person who is truly wise something that we all should I guess aspire to right blessed is the person who walks not in the counsel of the wicked or stands in the way of sinners, or sits in the seat of scoffers. But their delight is in the law of the Lord, and on that law they meditate day and night. They are like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that it does, he prospers. But the wicked are not so. They are like chaff, which the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, or sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. We um, want to come to that time of our service when we uh, bring our prayers and our praises, our thanksgivings to the Lord. And uh, as Christians, we should always be folks who have an attitude of gratitude to God and all he's done. We do want to bring our concerns to the Lord as well. We especially want to bring uh, those areas that are struggling with these terrible fires out in the west and in our neighbors to the north in Canada. Also those places that are very troubled even as we speak today, those places in the world that are troubled with violence and war and revolutions and so forth. So let's uh, take that to the Lord in prayer. And as I conclude, let's join together and uh, we'll pray the words that Jesus taught us. Almighty God, we thank you <clears throat> for this beautiful day, for all of the beautiful days that you have given us. And even, Lord, if, 
if we're watching this on a day that might not be so beautiful, we give you thanks for it. For each and every day, rain or shine, is a gift from you, and we give you that praise for those days. We thank you that we could join you, especially through this medium of Cat TV, and just pray that this service will be a blessing to everyone who hears it today. We just pray that our hearts will be open to your word and to hearing your word and obeying your word and being wise as the psalmist talked about earlier. We know that there are many areas of the world that are very troubled. We are struggling still with this pandemic in some places increasing. We pray for that situation. We pray, Lord, for those areas in California and Canada which are suffering from fires. We pray that you'll be with the folks who are trying to deal with that. And those areas in the world, Lord, that are st struggling with violence and war and revolution and just the multitude of, of controversy and, and difficulty that that brings, we just pray for each and every situation. And for those who may be ill, whether in mind, body, or spirit, be with them, we pray. And for those who are mourning, who have lost loved ones, Lord, be with them as well. And gracious God, lastly, be with us. We go about our daily task each and every day, doing this and that, whatever we need to accomplish. We need a very special touch from you that we will be the people you've called us to be. We ask this in Jesus' name and for his sake and his coming kingdom, even as we pray his words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom Come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our second uh, hymn our second hymn is, uh, in uh, is Softly and Tenderly, a wonderful, old, beloved a hymn of prayer. And uh, it's one that has been sung for over a hundred years. And um, it just speaks so much of God's presence um, in our life. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. Calling for you and me. See on the portals he's watching and waiting, waiting for you and for me. And then these, wonder, these wonderful words, Why should we tarry when Jesus is pleading, pleading for you and for me? Why should we linger and heed not his mercy, mercy for you and for me? Come home, come home, you who are weary, come home. Jesus is calling earnestly, tenderly. Jesus is calling. <clears throat>
This is a time of our service where normally we take our tithes and offerings. And um, we always want to remember God's blessings. Always remember what God has done for us. And in that attitude of gratitude, to return thanks to him. Let's uh, pray in thanksgiving for all that God has given us. Gracious God, you have blessed us in so many ways. It's a privilege and a joy to return something to the work of your kingdom so that others, lonely, lost, and afraid, might know of the great love you have for them. We ask your presence in our hearts to make us generous. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we come to that time of our service where we want to share our scripture readings um, uh, with you. And our first reading is taken from the book of the prophet Isaiah. And um, it's concerning the coming Messiah. It's chapter 11. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his, the, his roots, and the spirit of the Lord shall be upon him, and the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and he shall delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what his eyes see or decide by what his ears hear, but with righteousness shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. Righteousness shall be the girdle of his waist, and faithfulness the girdle of his loins. And then this wonderful picture of this idyllic place. The wolf shall dwell down with the lamb, and the leopard with the kid, the calf and lion and the fatling together, and the little child shall lead them. And our New Testament reading is taken from Colossians chapter 3. If then you who have been raised with Christ seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God, set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. For you have died and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you will appear with him in glory. Put to, get to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you once walked when you lived in them, but now put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and foul talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have been put off the old nature and have put on a new nature. <clears throat> and our gospel reading is taken from John chapter 14. Let not your hearts be troubled, those beautiful words of Jesus himself. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms, and if it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And when I go <clears throat> and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself. And you know where I am going. But Thomas said, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And I want to conclude with those very familiar words from the psalmist. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies, and anointest my head with oil. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Well, at this time, let us again turn to the Lord in prayer. Gracious God, we've heard your word. Now open our lives and our our hearts to the fulfilling of that word. Amen. Well, those last words, of course, were some of the most beloved in the entire Bible. 
And uh, none is closer to the heart of a believer than those very words, because it tells us so much about the character of God himself and the purposes of God and the place of the individual in God's plan, because God has this wonderful plan for us. It reminds us that each and every one of us have a place and a room in God's home. That was the promise of Jesus, you see. We often think of that as sort of stepping out into eternal life, which is, that is a big part of that. But it also tells us, maybe more importantly, that there's room in God's house and in his, his dwelling place for each and every one of us. That's the good news that people want to hear. People feel very estranged from one another these days, and it's been exasperated by, by the pandemic and so many other things, social distancing and so forth. They want to know that there's a place for them, a place where the shepherd is in charge and that the shepherd is looking uh, out for them. You know, some of us remember that parable that Jesus taught about the sower. You know, this time of year it's a good parable. He went out and he sowed uh, seed and some fell on, on weed-choked soil, some on barren soil, some on rocky. But a lot of it fell on good soil as well. And so when we sow generously, it's never in vain because God will help that to plant and to grow. And so into the harvest storehouse that the Bible talks about, into those mansions that Jesus talked about, the good seed will be stored. Those who hear and receive and accept the word of God in a living manner. And so we, we just join together in that divine work, don't we, with God in sowing the seed and to welcoming people in that. But you know, one of the things that takes, an important thing that it takes, is attitude. It takes a, a positive attitude, a stepping out in faith. Not just an attitude of ourselves, but realizing that when we do the work of God in the world, that God is with us, and that God's plan will be worked out whatever we do. You know, we remember that shepherd who went out after that one sheep, the one that had strayed. Maybe you feel like you're that straying sheep sometime, but he went after her, after that sheep and rescued it and brought it back into the fold, into the mansion, into the storehouse. So you get this picture of a place for us. It was written um, many years ago, the Psalm 23, a time when sheep and sheep herding were common. They're very common around this part of the world. And uh, it tells us so much about God and God's purposes in our lives. And we have to always have that attitude of gratitude when we think of all that God has done for us and will do for us and has done for others. And you know, I can't think of any other, <clears throat> any other faith tradition that talks about the shepherd being that loving, caring, giving shepherd, the one that goes out, who goes the extra mile, who goes the extra distance to rescue those who are lost. And not only does that, but brings them back and has a place for them. That Lord has a place for all of us. It is that relationship which defines the relationship that we have with one another as well. That's why we have to have that attitude because we are called as servant, servant followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're told to give as Jesus gave. And what did Jesus give? He gave everything and he gave his very life for each and every one of us. And the closer we draw to him, the closer we're drawn to others around us as well. And we're drawn to them as well. It's like a pyramid as we grow closer to the Lord, those on the journey we grow closer to as well. One pastor said, a vivid contrast to he fe feeds on ashes, that image that is in the scripture, is that there's something about the word flock that is so comforting. It tells us of our divine care and oversight, and it tells us that we're part of this one family. You see, a flock is not just a wild collection of sheep. It is, it is a unit. It is a family unit. It belongs, as someone says, to the master. And it's watched over and protected and guided by that master. 
And you know, sometimes when we're prone to wander, prone to wander, here I feel it, one of the hymns tells us. When we have that propensity, God gently brings us back. We often see that image of the shepherd, and shepherds do use these large crooks, right? And, that, and reaches out to gently bring us back. To gather the lambs in his arms, as the Bible tells us, and to carry them to that place of rest. Whether again, it's a storehouse, or a mansion, or a green pasture, whatever it might be. If we follow the shepherd, the good shepherd, he will indeed keep us from all of those rocky, difficult places that we ought not to go. Always the shepherd gives us the opportunity to lay hold upon the love that will never ever disappoint. So much in life disappoints. People disappoint you. Employers disappoint you. So many disappoint along life's journey, right? But that the Lord will never disappoint. And that, tr that truth is as strong today as it was in the New Testament period. And that forgiveness that we have wipes away the old, the war, and the fallen, and it gives us a brand new start a brand new start. Remember that beautiful story that Jesus told, the parable of the, law, of the lost son. He wanted his inheritance right away. He wanted it, and he was given his inheritance. And he went off and he just, as they say, partied the money away. And he came back broken and dejected. And he came back not as a son, but he thought, well, I can get a job as a servant. It's better than nothing. And he came back, and what did the father do? took off the old ragged garments, put a beautiful new garment, a ring on his finger, and welcomed him back as the son who was lost but was, was found. You see, that father and his home, that father was a still point in the changing world. It was the one certainty that that young man had. And even though he wasn't quite certain if the man wanted to really be his father again, he was certain that his kindness and his love for others would find some place for him. And when he got there, he got more than he could ask or think, as the Bible says. We live in a world that finds itself needy indeed. And reflecting on the words, I shall not want, someone has said, ours is a hungry generation. And isn't that true? We're hungry for so much, not just food or drink. We're hungry for the latest technology, the latest gadget, the latest gizmo, whatever it is. We want that. We've got to have it, and we feel slighted if we don't have it. And nothing, nothing satisfies. We are insatiable. And sometimes this, this emptiness, even in, in, in the midst of, of plenty, takes the form of depression. That everything sort of lacks something. We can be in the most beautiful environment. We can, we can be at the most incredible restaurant with the most amazing meal in front of us. We could be looking out over the most incredible vista, but if there's that lack, none of it makes a difference. That am emptiness breeds anxiety, and we have no happy times at all. Rather, we, we kind of just kind of dwell on all that's missing. The glass is always half empty, isn't it? It's always half empty. It's never half full, and it's certainly never full no matter how much we continue to pour and to pour into that glass. For all that we have, there is still for so many the sense that there could be more, so much more. And that's what we're going after. Always going after what they used to say, the brass ring. Always going after the brass ring. <clears throat> we were, we're like a collector. Many of you collect, people collect all kinds of things, don't they? People collect stamps. People collect cars. They collect figurines. They collect whatever it is. People are collectors, aren't they? We're like that collector who who looks not at what they have, this cabinet filled with whatever that beautiful collection is, but that one piece, that one little place on the shelf that's empty that they're still looking for. And they tell themselves, if I could just get that one piece for this collection to be complete, and I would be unspeakably happy. If I only had that, then I could boast to one and all of the uniqueness of this incredible collection of mine. But it seems that even when one acquires that elusive find, there's always one more that they need. The scripture tells us, however, that godliness with contentment is great gain. Because if you're content, <clears throat> you're not constantly 
grasping, reaching, stretching for that brass ring. The thing is we always compare ourselves with those around us and if we know somebody has a similar collection and theirs is full then we're incredibly jealous. There are those however who have far far less and live much happier lives. We live in a world with a great deal of poverty, a great deal of need and that should be humbling enough to force us to check our own attitude and to give back in love. And it's not simply the needs of the body that the Lord meets, but more importantly those of the soul and the spirit of well. And we're blessed in so many ways. We're blessed by people around us in our church families and those who encourage us, those who pray for us. But what people need to realize is that God loves them, God is with them, and God will meet their needs. And you know in this chaotic world, and I'm not going to give a long litany of all the various problems that we face, we need to know that God is still on the throne, God reigns, his kingdom is secure, and God is in control. We need to know that. And so the next time when we're disappointed, when things don't go our way, when all we see is lack and need rather than the blessings we do have, we need to pause and to step back, check that attitude and say, wait a minute, I have A, B, C, and D and so much more. I'm blessed above so many. The shepherd is still watching his sheep, each and every one. And if they do wander off, he'll go looking only. We have that promise in scripture. That's not to say that it isn't, it, that it isn't difficult to grasp this at times. So much of life can come at us all at once and we don't know how to handle it. And there are many times when the whys of life go unanswered. We're often left with so many more questions and we never think we'll ever get the answer. And perhaps on this side of eternity we won't. But someone said, I know, Timothy said, I know in whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to guard and keep that which has been entrusted to, to me until that day. God is able even when we are at the limit of our understanding. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. There isn't naturally an exclamation mark at the end of that sentence. But it certainly seems to warrant one, doesn't it? It does indeed. He has come to give us that abundant life. What did the psalmist say? My cup and my cup didn't just go half full. My cup didn't even just go up to the edge. My cup overflowed. There was more than enough. As Christians, we're called to look beyond, however, the pressing needs of the immediate and the everyday and to look to that which is beyond. We don't necessarily need the latest gadgets, gizmos, or whatever. We need to look inward and not upward. There's far too little introspection these days. Someone said contentment should be the hallmark of the man or woman who has put their affairs in the very hands of God. It should just be a natural thing, that content contentment. This applies especially in this affluent age that we live in, in this part of the world. But the outstanding paradox is the intense fever of discontent among people who are ever speaking of security. Despite an unparalleled wealth, in assets. We are outstandingly insecure and unsure of ourselves. No matter how much we seem to acquire, we're still not quite stable, are we? Always men and women are searching for a safety that's outside themselves when they should be looking up for the only safety that they have. They need to rest in him. Augustine was one of the most interesting people in the history of the church. He had a wild a wild youth, but he had a devout praying mother, Monica, and she prayed again and again and again for her wayward son, Augustine, or Augustine, depending on how you pronounce it. She prayed and prayed and prayed, and finally he turned to the Lord and his life was transformed. And he was able to say, our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. He looked here and there in just crazy living for whatever it was he was seeking and he found that he had that, that, that need and that need could only be met by the Lord, could only be met by the Lord. He was, he was 
the one that could meet that need. People are looking all over the place for things and they can't find us. But if we learn that godliness with contentment, then we can truly know that peace which passes all understanding. We can learn that whatever my lot, you have taught me to say it is well, it is well with my soul. We can affirm that in spite of our outward circumstances, we are indeed truly blessed each and every day. Someone said, you, you and I could pray like the old Puritan. That old Puritan sat down, folded his hands, bowed his head in front of a meal of just bread and water, and he said and declared with utter faith, all of this and Jesus too. Can't we be equally content? Paul says that contentment is gain. When we surrender to God the circumstances of our discontent, we don't just give up something, we gain so much more. We gain so much more. Just like that shepherd, he went after that one sheep, and what did he gain? He gained one sheep. Or the sower, what did he gain? He gained an abundant harvest. Oh yes, yeah, some fell on rocky ground, some fell on, you know, thorny ground and all the rest of it. But he gained a harvest nevertheless. And that starts with this change of attitude that we need to have. A change of attitude, of heart attitude, and mind attitude, and spirit attitude. <clears throat> and I want to share a little reading about that from an author who said concerning attitude, attitude is more important than facts. That grabs your attention, doesn't it? I say, well, these are the facts. These are the facts here. What do the facts say? But this, this author tells us that attitude is more important than facts. It's more important than the past, than education, money, circumstances, failures, or successes than what other people think or say or do. We're so worried, aren't we, at times what other people think and say. It's more important than appearance or ability or skill. It will make or break a business, a home, a friendship, or an organization. And isn't that true? The attitude is that powerful. The remarkable thing is that I have a choice each and every day of what my attitude would be. So this author is saying, we have that choice. God has given us free will. He has given us choice, and we have the choice that we can make. And he says, I can't change the past. I can't change the actions of others. I cannot change the inevitable. The only thing I can change is attitude. Life, he concludes, is 10% what happens to me and 90% of how I react to it. It's 10% of what happens and 90% how we deal, it, deal with it, how, what attitude we bring to the challenge. And I think that the word challenge is always better than problem. Problem can just knock us down, but a challenge is like an athletic event. We want to run the race and get to the end. It's a challenge. So if we look at things not as a problem, maybe even eliminate that word problem from our vocabulary and embrace the word challenge, things will change. God replaces all of those terrible burdens and, and prob so-called problems into challenges that make us stronger. And we can gain in our relationships with others. We can gain in uh, those precious hours that God has given us. And we may gain a self-knowledge of the one who loves us so much that he gave us his son. Amen? Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you that... Uh, that with the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, changing our attitudes, transforming us from the inside out, our whole perspective can look different. Like putting on new glasses with new lenses, we see a world crisper and cleaner and truer. We pray, Lord, we will be submissive to your will and to your attitudinal changes in us. Amen. And as we uh, conclude, um, we uh, are going to conclude with uh, a hymn of thanksgiving, a wonderful hymn of thanksgiving that uh, we often sing, actually sing at Thanksgiving time, but it's not strictly that. It's now, Thank We All Our God, a great old hymn. Uh, and I just want to share the first verse with you, and then we'll listen. 
Now thank we all our God with heart and hand and voices, who wondrous thing has done, in whom the world rejoices, who from our mother's arms has blessed us on our way with countless gifts of love, and still is ours today. Now thank we all our God. I want to thank you for joining us today as we worship here through CAT TV. Uh, just to remind you that we do meet on Sunday mornings at 127 Church Street in Shaftesbury, and we'd look forward to meeting you there and saying hi in person. Uh, please come by. If you have any questions, contact us. We'd love to talk to you about our church and our church services and upcoming events as well. And uh, we continue to. Uh, to um, pray uh, for all of you um, and lift you up to the God who loves us. And so, um, until we meet again, may God hold you in the hollow of his hand. <laughs>